So, um, hi, I'm Maxim. I'm going to, to talk about DRM and hopefully woke you up a little bit. Um, so, I'm an embedded Linux engineer for free electrons for like five years and a half now. So, I've been working on mostly Linux mainline development. Um, and as such, I'm the maintainer of both Linux and U-Boot for the old winner SOC. And so, as part of that maintainership, I had to write a DRM driver, and that's why I'm talking about it um, right now. Um, so, let's talk about DRM. Um, so, uh, quite a long time ago, so let's think about 80s, 90s, early 90s. Um, so, the display hardware was quite simple. It was basically just a memory buffer that was directly output to whatever screen you had. Um, so, um, in order to accommodate for this kind of simple display, uh, a simple API was created, uh, which is called, which was called FVDev, um, and which basically allowed for just a couple of things. Um, the main one was the mode setting, which is basically being able to enforce particular resolution, refresh rate, um, and so on on a, on a screen. Um, being able, obviously, to access that frame buffer in order to, for the applications to draw something um, on the screen. And then you had some optional 2D accelerations um, functions in order to be able to draw um, copy memory faster uh, if the hardware allowed it, um, which wasn't always the case. And then you had like quite a nice feature as well was that you could map basically the registers of the um, hardware controller that, tried, that was driving the frame buffer, which is pretty bad um, because it breaks basically all kind, any, any abstraction that you could expect from the kernel. And so you had in X um, some, or whatever your display stack was, um, mostly it was X at the time. Um, you had some drivers that were in user space which were in charge of basically doing all kind of hardware specific quirks, um, which is bad, um, but yeah. And so it looked basically like this. Um, you had the buffer on the left, um, and one thing that was quite interesting as well uh, was that the buffer could be bigger than the actual displayed size. Um, and so you had a window on that buffer, um, which was then output on the screen. Um, the fact that the buffer could be uh, bigger than the displayed part was actually quite nice if you wanted to have some things like scrolling. Uh, you could just like move the window without needing to redraw um, the frame, which was interesting. Um, it was also interesting to do things like double buffering or triple buffering, um, but we're going to talk about what it is um, in a couple of slides. But yeah, so simple hardware, simple um, API. Um, the thing is, um, starting at the late 90s, um, hardware tended to be more advanced, um, and you had basically two trends, um, which were um, not exclusive, so basically both passes followed two trends, um, but um, so embedded devices um, needed low power, and so they were needing to reduce as much as possible the CPU usage in general. Um, and so they had display engines, so the thing that actually takes a frame buffer and outputs it on the screen, that were able to um, um, do more and more. Um, and then you had also desktops um, that started to have GPUs in order to like accelerate 3D operations. Um, um, yeah. So obviously embedded devices then had GPUs as well. Um, the PCs also had uh, more and more complex display engines, um, but mostly these were the two trends on those uh, two kinds of um, devices. Um, and so in order to accommodate for these new GPUs, um, a, frame, uh, um, a framework in, the, in Linux was created, which was called DRM for Direct Rendering Manager, Management, Management. Um, and then for embedded devices, you just had more acts piling in um, that were supposed to accommodate for this new hardware, but not really fitting anything. Uh, so for example, a very good example of that is OMAP DSS, which basically if you had to do it today would have no sense in being here in the first place. You would just create a DRM 
device. Uh, but at the time, you didn't really have that option, so you had to have something like that. Um, yeah. And so this uh, display engine could actually do something like uh, what's shown on the screen. You could have several frame buffers now um, that are completely separate, and then you would push several buffers to the display engine. And the display engine in hardware could like do the compositing by itself um, without any intervention from the CPU, which was quite interesting. So for example, a typical use case would be to have some kind of background image. Um, and then a window on top of it and the cursor. And so you could, in this case, move the cursor without the CPU being more involved than just setting the new coordinates of the cursor, and that's it. So it's very memory efficient, um, CPU efficient as well. Um, um, yeah. And it's features that are actually quite, um, quite used these days. Um, for example, in Android, this is a um, split that they do when you, when you have an image uh, on the screen. So for example, you have this um, dialog box here uh, on top of your like, launcher in Android. Um, this is how they are going to split them into multiple frame buffers. Um, so they use an algorithm that is called the rectangle one um, for obvious reasons here. Um, but it mostly means that if you ever want to change the frame buffer to, for example, change the dialog box or change the hour because you have passed one minute, for example. You just have to redraw re this and this um, without having to do the composition all over again. Um, so this is quite efficient when it comes to CPU. It also is quite efficient if you want to talk about memory bandwidth um, because, so these days, um, so uh, for example, 4K frame um, with 32 bits per pixel, which is the like, kind of usual format um, render that for 60 hertz is going to take about two gigabytes, two gigabits per, per second um, of memory bandwidth. And if you had to do this composition by CPU, uh, you would have to like move the frame three times back and forth from memory. Um, so that would be like six gigabits to just draw something very simple just because your hardware has changed, which is very inefficient. And so now the hardware is able to do that uh, very, very easily. Um, um, so DRM was introduced. Um, so the exact, I've looked in the uh, Thomas history git that you mentioned the other day. Um, and I couldn't find exactly when, but it was around, well, basically way before Git even was introduced. Um, and so its goal at the time was basically just to drive the GPU. Um, so it was here to initialize um, the card, load its firmware, um, and then being able to share the command queue of the, of the GPU um, between multiple applications that would, be able, but that would basically need to do some rendering. Um, and obviously manage the memory in order to allocate buffers that you could send to the GPU as well. Um, but since it was made only for the GPU itself, uh, mode setting wasn't part of this API at the time um, and this framework, and all the mode setting was pushed to the user space um, in X. Um, so basically you were still pretty much in the same situation where you had to have uh, some kind of a device specific uh, driver in X that would need to initialize the hardware. So it would need to have direct register access to the hardware, being able to, um, well, know how it behaves basically, um, which led to a couple of issues. The first one is obviously the lack of abstraction. Um, and then you had some other issues, like you had to have um, one graphical application that, were, that was basically taking the responsibility to initialize it. Um, but then it also meant that you all only needed one. If you had two, obviously they would like step on each other's toes, so that, no, that was not working. If your application, so like X was crashing, then you didn't have any kind of display involved at all as well, so it was kind of an issue as well. Um, and, and what motivated finally the switch to an API that was able to allow mode setting was especially that in the GPUs, the interaction between the mode setting itself um, and the rendering was, well, basically there was more and more interaction that was difficult to get right when you were involving kernel and user space at the same time. 
Um, so basically, there was an introduction of a new API inside DRM that was called KMS for kernel mode setting um, to move mode setting back to the kernel um, and so remove all the mode setting code from the user space in order to have, well, remove all these kind of uh, drawbacks and uh, synchronize more easily um, the, um, the, the operations between rendering and, and mode setting. Um, so um, then you would obviously be able to remove FBDev or even, well, even start to implement it on top of KMS. Um, so this is actually what we have today. We have an FBDev emulation layer written on top of KMS. And then someone in this room uh, actually called for a deprecation in 2012 uh, of FBDev, which didn't really work at the time, but still kind of worked um, because the last FBDev driver that was merged was in 2014. And since KMS was introduced, we also had uh, the API to accommodate for all these kind of embedded devices that needed some kind of complex um, display engines. Um, so the first ARM DRM driver was um, one from Samsung that was merged in 2011, and then you had a, like basically all the ARM SOCs now have a DRM driver. Um, so you have ARM's own um, IM logic, uh, which is on this board, um, actually has one. Uh, all winner devices has one, Tigra has one, well, basically anyone has it. Um, and even uh, for small displays on SPI that you would use, for example, for, um, like, you know, those kind of small displays that you use with Raspberry Pi, usually. Um, it's even supported in DRAM now. Um, so there's basically no, no user left in the FBDev anymore, um, or no use case even. Um, and so, initially, DRM was um, created for devices that were both displaying and rendering. So basically, your graphics card that you plug into your PC um, that will basically do both jobs. Um, but in embedded devices, it's not really quite like that. Usually, you have a display engine that is um, most of the time designed by the SOC vendor, um, but not always. You have some like companies like Synopsys um, that do them as well. And then the GPU is a complete, completely separate entity in, in the SOC that comes from yet another CPU, so you have a couple of them. Um, so Qualcomm made, made some uh, ARM as well. Imagination, I'm not sure how it, how it works now, but they used to make some at least. Um, and so they were completely different de uh, devices. Um, and yeah, the other issue we had was that um, DRM and KMS were basically two different APIs for two different kind of things. So DRM for the GPUs, KMS for the display engines. Um, but they were basically exposed on the same device file. Um, and you would have the same level of privilege required for both operations, kind of family of operations, if you want. Um, and you only had one master, which meant that if you wanted to just talk to the GPU, for example, to do off-screen rendering, or even GPGPU these days, um, or you just want to compute something, you still had to have one component that were uh, basically the master on the, of the DRM device, um, so some kind of graphic stack usually, um, that was running on the system and was um, basically granting you um, authorization on the device to be able to, well, render something with even if you didn't have any screen or didn't want to display anything, which was kind of an issue. Um, and so there was a split between um, card and render nodes. Um, so basically they just kill, um, made a separation between KMS devices, DRM devices, um, and APIs that are on, exposed on only one device with different level of privileges as well. Um, so yeah, basically it allows now to have GPGPU operation, off-screen rendering, um, more flexible access control as well. Um, because basically the operations that do not require, require any privilege have been moved to like another file. Um, yeah. Am I late? <laughs> um, so this is basically what the KMS pipeline looks like. 
um, if you're just looking at the like Linux representation of things. Um, so you have usually um, several planes here. Um, each plane has one or more frame buffer attached, um, and then all the planes go to one or more CRTC, then to an encoder, then to a connector, and finally to a display. Um, so um, the planes are basically the source of the images. Um, so it's basically, um, um, yeah, whatever image you want to set um, to to your to your um, to your application. Um, the thing is, you have mm, it's not really a one-to-one -one mapping to a frame buffer because you might would, uh, to do you might want to do some things like. Um, page flipping um, and double buffering. And in this case, the plane will be the source of the image, but the buffer that is backing it is going to change at runtime. So basically, it's, it's here to address um, what's called the tiering effect, which is, uh, for example, where is my pointer? Here. It is. No. Where it is? So if you want to update the buffer, and if you have a single frame buffer, um, so you had the former image that is here, and you want to like do, um, replace it with this, the, the image on top, um, if you do it while the screen, uh, while, while the buffer is being displayed, obviously you will start with the former image, um, and then you will have the half, um, last part of it, that is going to be the new image, which is, which is going to be like a weird artifact, um, and then the new image on the next frame. Um, so it's not very nice to see. So usually what you want to do in this case is do double buffering. Um, so you have the pixel pointer, so basically the buffer that the, um, that the display engine is going to scan out um, is, is here. Um, and then you prepare your frame in another buffer. Um, and then you have some poses at the end of each lines and each frames um, in, in hardware. Um, so obviously we do not want to use um, the end of each line, it's not very useful to us, but the pose at, each, at, uh, at the end of each frame is very useful um, because here you will be able during that pose to switch the two buffers um, and then the display engine is going to scan out um, the new buffer uh, without any kind of tiering effect because you synchronize it with uh, a pose in, in that scan out. Um, um, so that's why you may have several um, frame buffers per, per plane. Um, and this used to be, um, you could do it with Abidev as well if you allocated a buffer that was twice the window that you wanted to have displayed on the screen um, and just move the window back and forth between the top half and the bottom half. Um, but yeah, it's just way more flexible that way. Um, so um, the next component, the pipeline, is the CRTC, which is going to be the one that does the composition, um, take all the planes from memory, and then um, create some kind of internal representation of what the image is going to look like. Um, it also is the one that will usually contain all the display mode resolutions, parameters, and, and, and so on, so that it's able to generate a nice looking frame. Um, then it will push that internal image representation to an encoder that will, um, basically the job of the encoder is take the, those raw data and encode it to something that is actually um, useful to the outside. So basically for HDMI, it's going to be, for example, TMDS. Um, it's basically the content of that image, how you represent it on, on that bus. Um, um, so you will, you're going to have one for HDMI, a different one for VGA, for example, um, this kind of things. Um, and finally, the connector is basically the physical connector you have on your machine, embedded device, um, and so on. So it's the one that will um, take those data uh, and will connect them to the, to the display. Um, it will be the component that will also handle the hot plug events for when you want to plug in uh, a new display and will, if you have any, uh, read the EDIDs, um, so the information that are given by the screen um, to be able to tell 
to Linux, um, what resolution it supports, um, what yeah, mode setting it, 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 can, it can accept. Um, yeah, so for example, you don't always have a one-to-one -one mapping um, in the hardware. So for example, on the all winner SOCs, this is what it looks like. Um, so you have a first, um, a first component that is called the display engine, which then gives um, the buffers to the timing controller, and then you, depending on the output, you have uh, multiple blocks involved, including one that is called the TV encoder. Um, and if you want to map that to the TRM representation, it looks like something like this. Um, so the planes are only implemented in the display engine, but then the CRTC is both the last part of the display engine and the first part of the timing controller. And then the timing controller also implements um, some kind of encoder. For example, if you want to like, output the video to display, you will not have any other kind of uh, connectors um, or encoders. Oh, it can like send them to some other block like the TV, connect, uh, TV encoder to be able to send it, for example, on a composite um, output. Um, yeah, so it's not always easy when you look at just the data sheet to know which component is doing what. Um, and if you look at it from the system point of view, this is how it looks like. Um, so we were talking about KMS, which is a mode setting um, API uh, exposed by the kernel. So if you want to like, display something um, on your machine, you're probably going to have an X11 plugin or a Wayland compositor uh, these days, which talks to um, a library that is called libdram, which is um, some kind of library to ease the interaction with uh, the DRM subsystem in general, um, including the KMS operations. Um, this libdrm will use a KMS API to talk to your driver in the kernel that will in turn talk to the, to the display engine, um, which is your hardware controller. Um, yeah. And then you have yet another API that is called gem, which is here to be able to allocate devices, um, uh, allocate memory, sorry. Um, so yeah, gem is here to allocate buffers that uh, can be accessed by um, the display engine, so for scan out, so for things that are going to be on the screen at some point, and um, that is supposed to be shared with some other devices. For example, it could be um, your video, um, some kind of video acquisition device, like a camera, of course. For example, if you want to do zero copy, you're going to allocate um, a buffer with jam and then like share it with um, with your DRM device so that you can like just push it without any copy involved. Um, if you want to do some rendering rendering of the GPU, you are going to use jam as well. So KMS also has some um, syscalls for you to allocate what they call DAM buffers that are supposed to be able to be scanned out. Um, so you can just um, allocate a window um, and display it without jam being involved, except that DAM buffers have no guarantee that you can actually um, use them for anything else than scan out. So if you want to share it with some other devices, then you have to use jam. Um, and so, then, depending on your setup, um, obviously, Gem will turn to some other, some some kind of memory allocator in, in the system. So on um, x86, where you have big machines, for example, usually you have video RAM in the graphics card as well. Um, so in this case, this would be uh, from the video uh, video RAM. In embedded devices, usually you just have one, well, one RAM, um, and then you would allocate through CMA in the kernel. Uh, a big chunk of that RAM to be able to like give the gem buffer back to user space. And if you want to use that buffer, you can use another API that's called Prime um, that is relying on the kernel on DMA buff and is basically just a, an API to be able to, like I was saying, export or import buffers coming from external device into DRM so that you can scan them out. Um, and if you have a GPU involved, um, 
if you're lucky, uh, and that your GPU is supported by MISA and DRM, which is um, quite common on x86, which is less so on embedded devices, you will have yet another DRM driver, or the same one, um, if, if it's just a single device, that will expose this time the DRM, the real DRM API, um, and MESA sitting on top um, that will imp um, implement all the um, like APIs to be able to do the rendering, some things like OpenGL mostly, but you, I think it, they even implement DirectX and, and this kind of things. Um, but yeah, mostly the OpenGL open implementation is going to be in MESA, and MESA is going to talk to the DRM um, device to submit um, the, the jobs. Um, yeah. And then, if you're unlucky, you have the vendor solutions. Um, so, for example, um, one of the most widely GPU is one coming from ARM, which is called the Mali. Um, so, depending on the generation, um, and I assume the license you buy, you have a different number of calls, but you have basically three main generations these days. Um, and you have two options to support that GPU. The first one is quite known and it's called Lima, uh, which is a reverse engineer proof of concept um, that basically triggers a reverse engineering effort that happened on all the other GPUs, like um, the one on the Qualcomm GPUs, which is Fried Reno, Etnaviv and Vivante GPUs, um, and there's others. Um, but the development is basically stopped since, uh, well, for three years. Some guy recently um, um, resumed the development and started to work again on a MISA implementation. Um, so he started a couple of months ago. So it, it's a guy working on his spare time uh, on something that is very complicated. So it's making progress, but it's not like very usable yet either. Um, and then if you want to have something that works, you have the, the one provided by ARM, which is quite featureful, that support most of the um, features that you might expect from the GPU. So you have things like thermal throttling, um, DVFS, and, and so on, but it's closed source. Um, or at least the OpenGL implementation of the part that is sitting in the user space is closed source. And then they provide a GPL um, kernel driver that you can, that will basically be able to well, replace the DRM, um, the, the DRM device. So you basically end up with something like this. Um, so you have your G GPU driver that is going to take the place of G the DRM driver previously. And then you have some kind of a custom um, API um, in the, uh, with the user space. And then you have the OpenGL implementation that is closed source in the user space um, that provides to the system the OpenGL implementation. So um, it's kind of a painful situation because basically you, you, you have a GPL driver. I'm going to stop a bit. Yeah, so you have, you have the, GPL, the, the GPU driver um, under the GPL. But since it's using some kind of non-standard um, interface and that the user space part has to have that kind of, that same interface um, and you don't have access to this code, obviously, you cannot really upstream anything, um, well, because it would break the user space part, which is just as important, so, yeah. Um, and so everything is pro pro usually provided by ARM, and it's pretty much the case uh, for every vendors. Um, so the GPL driver is on ARM's website, um, except that on the user space side, um, you just need to put the binary that they provided for your SOC. Um, the thing is, you have to keep that binary, that binary version in sync with the version, with the kernel, driver version you have in your system, which is kind of painful already, and then you cannot use um, the libraries coming from other SOC vendors using the same GPU uh, in your system as well, which complicates a bit. And then you have to deal with the usual libc ABIs as well um, and throw them into the mix. So basically, um, it's very difficult to find blobs 
unless you can actually talk to the vendor um, blobs that are um, basically compatible with whatever system you want to run, um, especially since they also rely on different APIs. So for example, you will have one blob if you want to use um, FBDEV, for example, for things like Qt, uh, and then you will have one different blob if you want to use Wayland, and then one different blob if you want to use X11, and you usually have access to only like one or two of these three. Um, so it's like very painful. Um, but if you're lucky enough, um, you will just have to slightly modify the driver side that they provide um, to put some kind of glue in order to have the GPU running um, so that you will basically tell it where to find the registers, which interrupt line it uses, what are the clocks, reset lines, power domains, um, probably operating points as well if you want to do DVFS and this kind of things, um, and then you're good to go. Um, Um, unless you're using X, which also requires some kind of um, plugin in order to be able to talk to your device. Um, so you usually have multiple plugins that are called DDX in, in X, in X11. Um, so the most widely known is um, mode setting, which requires KMS, but most importantly GBM, which is a user space API that is usually implemented by MESA. And um, it's supposed to allocate buffers. Um, and so some blobs provide GBM, some do not. So yeah, you probably will not have the option to use mode setting. And then you have ARMS, which is called ARM SOC, but is not only targeted to ARM, GPUs, so you could use it for basically any SOC that is using a third-party GPU, no matter if it's using ARMS or any others. Um, so it relies on KMS for display configuration, then you have to provide some kind of driver-specific um, IOC tools for, um, to allocate buffers instead of GPM, so usually you can add that kind of things. Um, and you have to provide some kind of hints on how um, your hardware is supposed to work. So for example, do you have a cursor in hardware? Um, um, how do your VBlank behave? That kind of things. Um, yeah. So I hopefully made a very brief introduction to DRM. Maybe it wasn't so brief, I don't know. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, if you have any questions, please go ahead. Um, I've been doing CEC, so I've tried out lots of different uh, DRM implementations. Mm -hmm. And one thing I notice is that the handling of hot plug detects seems to be hit and miss. Sometimes it is very quick, so it's hooked up to an interrupt. Sometimes it uses polling, so it can take seconds before it's detected. Sometimes it's not detected. Sometimes uh, you have to have something connected on boot for it to be detected. Is my impression is that this is a poorly tested area. Am I right or am I just doing? Um, it's also usually poorly implemented in hardware. Um, so that could explain part of it. I mean, it's probably both. Um, so you have indeed some devices that just, just hook it up on an interrupt and you're good to go and that usually works just fine. Um, you also have some devices that will do some pulling which are working well just as much as pulling can work um, so you can have some latency like you said and then you have just broken hardware that is supposed to work but not really why is there any reason why the hardware is apparently badly designed so often so it, it's it's i mean it's crucial to know when you connect or disconnect so i don't understand I'm just curious if there is a, if they're just lazy or is so there some I'm, reason I'm why just a software guy, but I, I've seen some discussions where um, some people were saying that, for example, detecting whether a VGA cable was um, plugged in, so in, in things like analog outputs, um, it was actually very difficult to get right, uh, and you always had some, at the hardware level, and so you always had some kind of glitches, um, and it was basically never working. Um, 
on my device it seems to work just fine, but it's like discussions from other kind of discussions, yeah. Uh, in particular with Nouveau on the NVIDIA cards, uh, I so to the best of my knowledge it uses polling every two seconds, and I think that's just because it's a reverse engineered driver and we are missing the documentation to imp implement it properly. And on the other hand, the Intel i915 driver uses interrupts because it's fully open source. Yeah, it can be that as well. Uh, it's not really a question, but I think the URL is, is broken. <laughs> yeah, I haven't pushed it yet. I should have. Um, yeah, okay. it is. <laughs> I didn't rip. I didn't rip my shirt either. <laughs> so on the user space blob thing, uh, some vendors are also seem to be providing a user space blob that only does the Android API, and then there's this lib hybris thing uh, that does some sort of Mesa to Android API. I think. Uh, can, you, can you explain it's that? It's not a to bit? Mesa to Android API. It's so hybris is just doing the conversion between Bionic and GNU libc. Um, so it's a conversion of libc's ABI. Ah, okay. If I got this right. Okay. Thank you. Can you speak a little bit about OpenCL? Where does it fit here today? Um, not really. Um, I, my guess is that OpenCL would be like, it's basically just sitting here. I think Mesa has some OpenCL as well, uh, support as well, and it would just talk to the DRM device. Uh, basically the DRM device is just queuing commands, making sure that the GPU can access buffers, so setting up the IO MMUs correctly and so on. So I can't see any particular reason why it couldn't go through the DRM, DRM API as well. Thank you. Is that as some OpenCL 1.0 code for one device? Every, for everything else, you need to use the proprietary drivers right now. Okay. Which basically work like the GL drivers, but have a different language. No more questions? Then that's it, I guess. Oh yeah, and I have bolts. Um.